Good morning, all. My name is Victor, and it's a privilege to be leading you in a time of worship this morning. Uh, to anyone who is new, uh, welcome to Bethel, and a uh, warm welcome to our brethren from Singapore as well. Before we begin, uh, let us come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning to give thanks to you for keeping us during the week and that we can come to your house this Sunday for worship. Lord, as we offer our worship, we pray that you would help us offer our worship in thanksgiving and that we may learn to hear and to respond to your word that would be given later on. We pray that you would be with us this worship service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In our current theme, the presence of God, we have been learning of the life of David and how he came to find the presence of God real in his life. What stands out to me is that God chose David over his other brothers. From 1 Samuel uh, in the Bible, we read that David was not regarded much, much in his family uh, by his father and by his brothers. His father did not even call him to present him before Samuel the prophet when Samuel had asked to see all his sons. Yet God chose David to reveal his presence to him and to raise him up to be a mighty warrior, a king of Israel, a psalmist, and more. God chose someone who everyone had uh, discounted. This greatly challenges me personally. Whilst it's a great priv privilege to be leading you in a time of worship, I can't help but recognize my own shortcomings. And it seems that with each opportunity I'm given to lead in worship, I find more reasons why I think I should not be standing before you today. But I'm encouraged and I give thanks to God for his word that helps us shift from focusing on ourselves to focusing on him and what he can do. How God chose David is a challenge to me to press on and to see that it is God, his presence and his working in our lives, the lives of those whom he has called. He makes all the difference. The first song I chose for us to open this time of singing is We Praise Thee, O God, Our Redeemer, found in the HWC number 16. May we be encouraged to focus this morning on the Lord and praise him for his presence in the lives of those in the past and in our lives today. Let us sing our first song together. Thank you for singing our first song. While God chose David and raised him up to be king, I have learned that David had a part to play as well. David's response was to cultivate faith in God until he became confident of the presence of God in his life. I came to learn when we read Psalm 18 that David too had fears. Rather than to be held captive by his fears, he chose to exercise faith. We learned that he exercised his faith when he stood up against lions and bears and rescued, when he stood up against lions and bears back when he was a shepherd. Rather than cower, he fought and struck down the beasts and, and he rescued the sheep which had been snatched by the predators. Through these encounters, he saw how God delivered him from the hands of the wild beasts each time, and he gained confidence in the presence of God with him. He gained such confidence in God that he dared to stand up against Goliath, the giant, and he knew God would deliver him from the hand of Goliath. I am thankful for the example of David in how he learned to build confidence in God. I certainly need to find this level of confidence in God's presence. And I recognize the opportunities I'm given in ministry are to help 
build my confidence in his presence. I am encouraged to exercise faith in the presence of God with each opportunity I am given, that I can one day find such confidence in his presence. The second song I chose for us to sing is Have Faith in God from the HWC 408. May we be encouraged to place our faith in God and to put our trust in him continually until we can find a strong confidence in him. Would you please join me in singing our second song together? From last Sunday's message, taken from Psalm 68, I have come to appreciate God's deliverance from trouble so much more. When the presence of God became so real to David, he began to see how many times God had delivered him in the past. I was also amazed at, at the many times Pastor Chris was spared when he was younger without even he knowing it. I can see how God was there in David and in Pastor Chris' example. Looking back, I myself too have been delivered many times in the past from grave situations. Just last week, uh, my life was at risk I was, as I was driving home from church. I had just been wished a safe drive home as I left church and as it had just rained heavily. I began to skid uh, significantly as I came off a roundabout. Every time I attempted to correct the car to get back straight on the road, the skidding got worse and I ended up losing control of the vehicle. The last clear thing I remember is I was he heading toward heating hitting the road railing, after which was a slope that led toward residential housing. In my mind, I was certain I would be hitting the railing and perhaps go down toward the houses. But at that moment, the car finally responded and I was back perfectly straight on the road once more. I was alone on the road at that time and I took the time to think. It, it was not because of how I was spared, because I recognized God's hand of protection, and I am grateful for his preservation. Many people who lose control of their vehicles that way have not had the same fortune that I had. But what weighed heavily on me is what I am doing with my life and how I plan to live the rest of my life out. These were difficult questions that were raised within me and I could not answer them fully. But my response was to have a stronger resolve to follow the Lord because he is the one who can enable us to live our lives significantly and with a sense of purpose. The last song I chose is Be Thou My Vision from the HWC 382. I chose this as a song of response to focus on God as our vision for this life he has given to us. Would you please rise and join me in singing our final song together, Be Thou My Vision. Thank you, you may be seated. I'll pass this time to Pastor Chris. Thanks, Victor. Okay, drive safely. <laughs> Check your tires too. Yeah, 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 really take things like that for granted. And um, okay, so we're glad that you, you've been kept. Right, little things like that. If we could only look at it and it says, "Wow, that was close." How did I uh, survive that? Okay, well, this morning we are going to take a look at, once again, uh, read Psalm 68. Uh, we've been reading Psalm 68 and the topic on the presence of God. And we're going to need the Lord's help uh, to appreciate it to under, uh, and to apply it. Okay, well, let's pray together for a while. Our Father, we thank you for your safekeeping. 
and we often can take that for granted. Help us to learn how to appreciate your presence in our history, in our life, even as we look backwards. Help us to appreciate it at a deeper level, with eyes of faith in the present. And help us to find that confidence, to face the challenges that is before us with your presence. We ask that you would bless as we read your word this morning. Help us to appreciate and to understand it and to find and to learn how to apply them, the principles we learn into our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, let's take a look at Psalm 68, and we are going to take up another portion of this text, which is quite really interesting, more ways than one. It just tells us sometimes, um, more often than not, the presence of God is not something that we actually understand easily, and it isn't. Okay, you mustn't think this is something very, very easy to understand. Our greatest struggle it is because God is invisible. How do you understand the presence of someone who is invisible as God is? And so sometimes uh, certain imageries are used, and th that can be helpful. Well, let's take a look at this. In Psalm 68, we read in verse 15. That's interesting. Today, we're going to be talking a lot about mountains. I don't know whether you know anything about mountains. Because look at this reference over here. A mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Why do you fume with envy, you mountains of many peaks? This is the mountain which God desires to dwell in. Yes, the Lord will dwell in it forever. Now, how do we understand a text like that? What has mountains got to do with the presence of God? It's even harder when we don't have mountains. I mean, Perth do not have mountains. The hills is not a mountain. Right? And that is the highest we, we go, right? We, we go, that's it. Well, our friends from the eastern states, they have, other, they have mountains. They have actual mountains. The blue mountain, which isn't blue. Right? They have, uh, the, the, the folks in Tasmania, they have Mount Wellington. And to them, this is like a national pride. We got nothing to pay proud. We have the bell tower, which isn't very tall either. Right? Now, remember, when I was a, uh, in, in high school, we had a school trip to Japan. And we were crossing this area in a, in a train where you see Mount Fuji. Now, to the Japanese people, they call it Fujisan. It is their national pride. And you don't get to see it all the time. Sometimes cloud clover, you can't see. Now, here is a foreigner, and was I anticipating Fujisan? No. The only Fuji I knew at that point was the apple. Fuji apple. And there was, I, and I didn't really appreciate it very, very much because I was actually so tired that the train ride from, uh, I, I can't remember now, but it was passing to, from Tokyo side down south. I think it was towards Okayama south, right? I was sleeping, and an elderly gentleman literally elbowed me. Wake up, young man, Fuji-san. <sighs> was I delighted? Absolutely not. I didn't speak a word of Japanese. I, I, I didn't know what I said. And I just, said, uh, I just carry on sleeping. Now, I think, now I appreciate Mount Fuji a bit better. That time, nothing. 
Do I have the same pride and joy? Will I wake people up to look at my mountain? No. He did. You know, in him, the very sight of Mount Fuji evoked a national pride. That's something. Something we all don't understand. What if this is what it was right here? The very presence of a mountain inspires, it invokes something inside you that can be quite special. Right? You have to be Japanese to understand it. Almost. Well, here it is quite hard because we are not of Israel. And it's sometimes hard to read a text like this. Nonetheless, let's try. Let's really try to appreciate this. Now, what is this mountain of God? It's special, not just because of its place and its uh, grandeur and all that. Now, let's turn to Exodus a little bit. And in Exodus 3, we see a reference to the mountain of God. Remember Exodus 3? This was the place. Why is it so significant to Israel? It's actually called Mount Horeb. Otherwise also known as Mount Sinai. Right? They're actually the same place. Now, let's take a look at Exodus 3. Right? We read uh, Moses was there. He was a shepherd back then. And then he led the flock to the back of the desert, came to Horeb. And then we see this reference, the mountain of God. It becomes special. This was a place that is really special to anyone else. It is an ordinary place. It's really special because something special took place there. God met with Moses and called him. You have special places in your life. Right? To, to some people, we know to us, Perth, what are the, some of the special places in Perth to you? Now, to a lot of friends I know you, for overseas, that blue boat house in Netherlands is on Instagram. Now, the council a headache because how are we, they have to pay to you know, sustain it, to make sure it remains blue because it's like apparently an international sensation. Right? Because people, any time of the day, literally, rain or shine, you drive past that place, somebody is there taking a picture. People have proposed there. People have gotten married there. People have maybe their first date there. People have, hey, it has become a to us, is a blue boat shed. Honestly, I haven't even been there. <laughs> Sad to say. All right? And for whatever reason, it's special. Horeb, what is that? Where sheep goes and graze. Mountain of God. And it becomes special. A place where you have met with God. Now, that becomes a special place. Okay? Now, that's a reference. Now, there is other references that we want to look at. Now, this became a significant place. Not just for... We're going to turn a, quite a bit to the uh, Exodus at Deuteronomy because a lot of Psalm 68 is actually historical. There's a lot of rich history behind it that we want to appreciate. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, for starters, okay, a few mountains to look at. One is the mountain of God, reference Horeb, Sinai. Right? There is also mountain Bashan, or Bashan. Now, we're going to take a look at a few of them. Okay? Now, what is the mountain of God here? Now, it has not only become special in Deuteronomy chapter 4 to Moses, but an entire nation. Now, let's take a look at it. Okay? Now, we read in Deuteronomy 
4. Verse 1, now, O Israel, listen. The, the statutes, the judgment which I teach you, observe that you may live. Go in, possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandment of the Lord which I command you. Your eyes have seen the Lord, what the Lord did at Baal. For the Lord your God has destroyed from among you all the men who follow those that worship those, the idols. But you have held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. Now, this is the second generation. This is 40 years later. Okay, so there's quite a bit of time lapse from Exodus 3 to what we are reading is 40 years later, right? Now, and then we read, Surely I have taught you statutes, judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded, that you should act according to all in the land that you should go to possess. Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is, now listen to this, this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people who will hear all this statute. And they will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. That's pretty amazing. For your wisdom, for your understanding, the two vital things we need in life to make sense of it, to be able to do well. What great nation, verse 7, this is their privilege. What great nation is there that God so near to it? As the Lord our God, as to us, for whatever reason that we can call upon Him, prayer, right? Nearness, how far away is God? A prayer away. And we must not take that for granted. Word, His word given, it gives wisdom, it gives understanding. And you can call upon God at literally whatever reason. What is your reason? Right? And then we read this, what great nation is there to have all these things, the statutes, the laws which God has given this day. Now, verse 9, only take heed to yourself, diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen. Right? And then, lest you depart from your heart all the days of your life. What do you want to do? Teach them to your children, your grandchildren, especially concerning the day when you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb, mountain of God. That was the place where God spoke with His people, right? Gather the people, let them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days of, right? And that is an important thing. Now, that was what my son said to me during the week. He said, Dad, as a pastor, doesn't mean God has to talk to you. Well, that was a very interesting question. There is a question for a six-year-old boy. I said, Dad, uh, I said son, um, don't know where he's coming from. Right? And so he said, isn't that a very scary thing? That God will talk to you. And to him, it is a, wow, this is scary. If God talk to me, I, I will be terrified. Absolutely. Should we be terrified? You know what? There should be that regard, that fear. Is it a good and healthy thing? I think we do. Should. In every sense of the word. To not have it isn't good. And so, 
we see here. Look at this earlier. That they may learn to fear me. Right? And Anne is important. That they may teach their children. You came near, stood at the foot of the mountain. The mountain burned with fire in the midst of heaven. Darkness, cloud, thick, cloud, thick darkness. Now, that's a very visual manifestation of the Lord's presence. And the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of the words, but you saw no form. You only heard a voice. So he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform the Ten Commandments. Wrote them on two tablets. The Lord commanded me at that time to teach you the statutes, the judgments, that you might observe them in the land which you are to cross over. Forty years later, it is become a significant place. Why? One, to Moses, personal. Yes, this is when I was called. And this is not just Moses. This is an entire nation. This is where God made a covenant with them. This is where God seals that special relationship with them. This is where God gave to them His commandments, His word, in other words. And if they would keep them, they would become that wise and understanding people. And so this is their rich history. You know, what about our history? You look at the history of others, and this is really, really rich. Right now, that's, that's with reference to Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb. Now, there's another mountain that is being compared. It's called the mountain of Bashan. Bashan is a place north of. This is a fertile place. Okay, We all often think of Joshua leading, right? And then conquering the land. And you know, the first few battles was actually done by Moses. There were two historical battles that has become famous in the history of ancient Israel. And that was the battle against two kings. One was called Sihon, the other one was called Bashan. Now, let's take a look at Deuteronomy 3, just backwards a little bit. Okay. Then we begin to hopefully appreciate why, what is Bashan all about. Okay. In chapter 3, and then we read, they turned, they went up the road to Bashan, and the king, the Og, the king of Bashan, came out against them. Right? Now, here is a king. Now, we're going to uh, see what kind of king this guy was. And he and all his people. Now, remember this. At this point, Israel did not even have their own fortress, no big cavalry, nothing. They were like nomads, led by Moses out of Egypt. And they were there crossing the lands and of course, they will be prey to a lot of other nations. This is like easy target. One of which was this king called Bashan. And then we read that he came with all his people to battle at Enre. The Lord said to me, which is Moses, said to him, don't be afraid. I don't know whether you appreciate words like that. And this one is something that Moses deeply appreciate. Don't be afraid, for I have delivered him and all his people and his land into your hand. You shall do to him as you did to Sihon, which has defeated him. The king of the Amorites who dwelt in Hashbron. So the Lord your God also delivered into our hands. Now, this is, of, of course, reflective right? Reflective. This is not forgotten. Delivered into our hands, the king of Bashan, all his people, we attacked him until no survivors took all the cities, not a city that 
we did not take 60 cities. And imagine that. All the regions, kingdom of Og in Bashan, these cities were fortified, high walls, gates, bars, besides great many rural towns. Remember, he came out to attack Israel first. Provoke them, attack them. No, they're sunk. This is called, def- you got to fight. You don't want a war you've just entered into. And to them, this is easy target. But to their horror, they lost. And they were utterly destroyed, all of them. And we read verse 8, we took the land from the hand of two kings of the Amorites, two actually great kings. One is Sihon and one is Og of Bashan. Now, let's, let's look at verse 11. Who was this guy? Why is, he so, why is he like that? For only Og, king of Bashan, remained it of the remnant of the giants. He is not a smurf. You know, so easy. Conquer 60. Yeah, if they were smurfs. This was not an easy opponent. This is giant. OG, Og, original giant. So you mustn't think (laughs) Goliath was the only guy. This one was there, the remnant of the giants. His bedpost was an iron bedstead, right? Nine cubics length for huge bed. You cannot find a size in your store. You go to bed shed, cannot. There's king size and there's og size. This is ha huh, giant. You customize this bed, thank you very much. No place is going to sell it to you. Obviously, this is you not forget this. This was such an awesome thing. See, sometimes the presence of God has to be that obvious. It's impossible, in other words, for them to defeat these people who came and attacked them. Mountain of Horeb is small. This is a mountain. This is to describe now power. This is to describe now influence. He's called a mountain of many peaks. Not just one, many peaks. And, you know, human beings, man has been a fascination of mountains, wanting to climb them, wanting to scale them, and then die along the way. It is not easy to scale any mountain. Not Mount Everest, not any of the mountains. The imagery here is this is a mighty, prosperous, powerful land. And that's a strange thing because let's go back to Psalm 68. Now that we know what Bashan is and we know a little bit about the mountain of God, okay? Listen to these words. Right? As we read Psalm 68 now. Verse 16. Why do you film with envy, you mountains of many peaks? Why did they attack Israel? Envy. That's a strange thing. You are the big boy, you are the giant here. Why would you attack a smaller player in the industry? Envy. Isn't that strange? And today is the same problem we see all over the place. You can call it office politics. You can call it whatever color or stripes you want. When people see you rising, doing well, they thought nothing of you. They thought nothing of them in Egypt. Until they start growing, oh boy. Until they start multiplying, the Pharaoh said they are becoming mighty. What did they do? They passed a law. All firstborn sons must be thrown into the river. Not to teach them to swim, to feed the crocodiles. Why? Why do you fume with anger, with envy? And people 
actually want to get you. Why? Wow, you're coming up, huh? You're rising nicely, huh? We will attack you before it's too late. Unfortunately, it happens all over the place. Why can't they? Why don't you stay where you are? Israel actually asked them nicely, can we pass through? Can we pass through? We will stay on the road. We will not. They said, nothing do it. We are coming. Why must you do that? They came in full force, partly to intimidate. To intimidate you. Right? You crossed the wrong path. This is called bullying. In, in, the, in the words of the world, this is really bullying. Bigger players. This is giant. The giant bullying the smaller fry. Hey, Moses with your rod. We will defeat you in half an hour. And to their horror, they were defeated, utterly defeated. Why? How come? This was David. Remember, David is a military person. He studies war strategy. One of the best things to do is study history. How did we, how did Moses succeed? Oh, the presence of God. You see, unfortunately today, we also study strategy. We include everything in our strategy except God. That's a problem. We include all the plans, our backup plans, our triple backup, our contingency plan, our this plan, that plan, every plan. But where is God in all our plans? And when the problem comes, what happens? You see what God has said? It stayed with Moses. The wisdom, the understanding that was there, the power that was there. Where's it all come from? You think it came from the mountain? Of course not. It came from the Lord. Now, that is something very, very special. Do I treasure this? Absolutely. I remember when I graduated um, from un in Murdoch University, that's where I, I went to, I did a master's in telecommunications. And it was during a time where IT and all the other... When I started, it was the... IT boom. When I graduated, it was the IT bus. It was the worst time to graduate. And so many of my friends, or one, one of them uh, said, Chris, why don't you come with me to London? Seriously. The industry there is great for telecommunication, and, and I have, uh, you know, I used to work there, and I can hook you up. I said, look, I appreciate that, but no. I, I want to be in Perth. Now, why do you want to do that? And another friend from Malaysia, and he said to me, and he, he was a good friend, actually. He was all my projects and everything and everything else. He knows that I'm a Christian. He's not. I've never pushed it either. Just live before him. And he said, look, um, you know, we, we appreciated our friendship. And he, uh, one of the things I said, look, on Sundays, I'm committed to my church. And he says, great, because on Sunday, I'm committed to my football. And we had a perfect partnership. So on Sunday, we both don't work. I do my thing, and he does his thing. And on Monday, to the rest, we work hard. And we did well. Great. I'm very, very grateful. At least, but he said to me, Chris, I know all these years I've known you, appreciated what you stood for, uh, your, your faith and everything, but... We're graduating now. We're entering into the real world. In the real world is dog eat dog. Do you really think your Christian values can keep up? You have to bend a little, don't you? You have to tell some white lies to succeed in this world. I remember what I said to him very, very clearly. Two things. One, I'm not a dog. Dog may eat dog, but I'm not a dog. Two, I believe with all my heart the words that I have looked at, learned what we are reading, the values, the principles, the wisdom and the understanding 
that I learn from the Bible will enable me to do well in the world. Now, I haven't got a job back then. You know, I am not saying this as one who has it. I'm not saying as one who is already accomplished. No, just like him, we both graduated, entering into the working force. Several years later, we met. By then, was working, and then he said, I, I reminded him, did you remember what you said? And he said, he smiled. Is it possible? Can you believe what God said all those years can stand the test of time like a mountain can stand the test of time. Mount Fuji will be there long after you are gone. And sometimes the words to help people understand that the Word of God is truly timeless, it will stand the test, the value of all its worth time will tell. Can you apply this in your life? And as a young lad, I did. I tried. And I'm glad. I really am. And so when you look at this, you see, you need that time. There is an Exodus 3. There is a 40 years later. And this is not just words anymore. This is 40 years of seeing the reality of the presence of God in your life, in the life of the people as you apply these things here. And that is what stands out. And will people attack you? Why? Sometimes you wonder, why would they want? No, they've got everything. They are more powerful. They are prosperous. They are doing well. They don't need you. And yet, they will. Envy. Why would you envy a p Israel? Bashan, Og, they had everything. 60 cities. You don't even got one to call your own. Isn't that strange? You have so much. And sometimes I wonder, it is so strange. These companies are so big. They own literally everything almost. And they want to take over a small one. That's man for you. That's the difference between the people of God and Og of Bashan. What is the people of God like? Now, this is a very interesting description, right? Uh, let's go back. And in verse 11, the Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those who proclaim it. Kings of armies flee, and they fled. Pharaoh defeated. Og defeated. Sion, these were great kings. Defeated by, now, look at this, right? Verse 13, you lie down among the sheepfold. Ah, huh? sheep. That's an interesting imagery to um, portray. Sheep, humble sheep. Yes, and then the next one. You will be like the wings of a dove, gentle, Right? One sheep, two dove. They are two, you know, you see the crest of kings. Usually you see dragon, you see lion, you see eagle. That's common. Right? It represents power, it represents aggression, it represents majesty. You know, you majest You never see a sheep, have you? I never see Sean the sheep on any, you know, crest, on any school logo. Now, my son's same school, we go to the same school, and their one is a wyvern. It is the, like a serpent, dragon, well, powerful and wise, and uh, that's what they think anyway. <laughs> but you're not going to have a sheep, especially a black one. Right? Why on earth would you do a sheep? 
And then you want to, what is Rome's, what do the Rome have? On right on their thing, the eagle, the mighty, majestic eagle. So are the United States of America, right? We have the kangaroo. Don't underestimate the kangaroo. It looks cute. Don't get too close. Just like us. <laughs> not really. I'm just kidding. That is, it's not, no, totally not. <laughs> totally not. No, this is funny where, how we identify with things. Now, this is off topic. This is just, you know, the sense of identification. Now, we, we should talk about this. You no, know, my, my daughter, <clears throat> her friend asked her, uh, you know, because same surname. Uh, this is uh, Elise Lai. And so said to my daughter, Chrissy, and said, um, you're a lie, I'm a lie. Are you from Malaysia? So Christabel said, no, I'm from Singapore. I looked at, I said, Chrissy, you said you, you're, you're not from Singapore, you know. <laughs> you were born here. For whatever reason, my daughter, because part grandma is there and her best friend is there, you know, all of the things she likes is there, her food is there. And so I said, how come you said you are Singaporean? She said, we go there so often. <laughs> and that is interesting. That really is interesting. You see, how do we identify ourselves? I'm going to conclude on a beautiful psalm. I, I must tell you, this is really beautiful, right? But we take a look at uh, these things here. The idea of a dove and a sheep. But you see, it's humility and gentleness. The dove is a reference to the, the, the gentleness. But look at this dove. It's no ordinary dove, okay? The dove is covered with silver. Her feathers are yellow gold. You're not going to find a kind of dove like that. Of course. When God is... There, he is in the midst of this people, a wise and understanding people. Remember, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It's presence of God, yes, but now seen in the people of God. People. His wisdom, his understanding, taught, instructed, it becomes, it's there. God is invisible. Yes, His people should not be invisible. I remember once this man said to us, he said, I know they are Christians, they are submarine Christians. I've heard a lot of references to Christian, but I have never heard about the submarine Christian. What on earth is a submarine Christian? So he described it. Say, a submarine Christian is, on the weekends, they surface. And then on the weekday, they submerge so deep into the ocean, nobody knows where they are. I was stunned for a while. There are all kinds of Christians. I've heard of the secret service Christian. They are in secret. Am I serving the Lord? Yes. Shh. Huh? Where? Secretly. This is secret service. They are submarine. It shouldn't be. That the people will know this is a wise and understanding people. It reflects their God. Right now, here is the beautiful psalm, Psalm 87. And it talks about the mountain of God with reference to Zion now. Okay? And this is such a, a, a wonderful psalm. It really is short psalm, but really beautiful. To understand this whole idea of the mountain of God, right? Now, let's take a look at this. In verse 1, his foundation is in the holy mountains. There we go. The Lord loves his, the gates of Zion. This is Jerusalem, historically built on the mountain. Now, not like Mount Bashan or great. This is a humbler mountain, small mountain. But you know what? God chose this mountain. And He loves this mountain. It's not the mountain, it's the people. He established a people, the city Zion. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. I will make mention of Rahab. Now, this is not the Rahab of Joshua. This actually is a reference to Egypt. This is Isaiah uh, 30, if you want to look up that reference. 
on Babylon and those to those who know me. That's the thing. To those who know me, O oh, Felicia, Tyra, Ethiopia, this one was born here. Now, this is the, not Israel anymore. These are Gentile nations. Tyra, Ethiopia, Philistia, these are Gentile nations. This one is born here. What does that mean? Can those who are from another nation become part of the city of God, belong to the citizen of the kingdom of God? Now, this is a, of Zion, it will be said. This one, that one born in her. The Most High Himself will establish her. The Lord will record when He registers the people. This one born here. Where were you registered? Right? Register. Where, where was I born? My, born Malaysia. In a small little town called Kluang. The hospital no longer exists. They have demolished it and made a freeway. That's where you are physically born. Can you be part of this now? Can the king record you down here, both the singers and the players of instrument, and they say, all my springs are in you. That life-giving water, that everything that is needed to sustain wisdom, understanding everything that is there, that represents everything. The city of God. This is a reference to the Lord, people, and that's special. So we can have a person who is born in Kenya. A few years ago, he was an overseas student. Today, he leads us all in worship, and I like the way he says, welcome our brethren from Singapore, and here is a person from Kenya. Exactly, we see this today, that God brings his people from all over, and he established, these are my people. Who are the people? Those who love him. Who are the people? Those who know him. Who are the people? Those who will live by his wisdom, the understanding that they glean from his word. What are the features? Sheep and dove. Huh? Yes. Are you sure your humility and your gentleness is going to survive in this world? Bless are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. No, you don't have to be like the world. You don't take over by aggression. You don't need to, to just keep on taking things. And that's what I said to my friend. Is it possible? Well, at that time, I said it with hope and faith, trusting that the Lord's word will be true to what it holds. Years later, you see its reality. And this morning, it's not just only in a life personal, but you see its reality in a people. And we've seen this. The presence of God, no longer mountains, that's what the Lord Jesus said. You worship. It is no longer this mountain or that mountain. The Father is looking for such to worship Him. What? In spirit and in truth. There is a heavenly Jerusalem. There is a spiritual Zion. And this is what we belong to with great identification, you know, just the thought of it just evokes pride and joy. Like I said, yes, God is invisible. His word isn't, his work isn't, his people. Let's not be invisible. Let's be that people everywhere we are. Let's care for people. Let's really, with humility and gentleness and everything else, truly, can we make it? Yes. And we've been making it for the past 25 years, not by accident. Let's keep going. Let's keep trusting the Lord at His word. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company, the congregation, who proclaim it. Well, let's do that. To our children now, to 
one of these days to those who are grandparents out there. By the way, I was just told, it is Father's Day in Singapore and other places in the world except Australia. This is how, how unique we want to be. Right? So, happy Father's Day to all those who are celebrating. May you have a wonderful Father's Day. Our Father's Day is in September. So, if you come back in September, you get two Father's Day. <laughs> right? But let's be there. Let's teach our children these things. Let's teach them the way of the Lord. Let's teach them the word of the Lord. Right? And people, look at what is this? Then you can pray like that. You can call upon God like that. Yes, it is our privilege and joy. We're not submarine Christians. We're just Christians. Right? Gratefully Christians. Sinners saved by God's amazing grace. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the word that you give. Way back in the days of Moses, that word could build up an entire nation. It could take a group that seems so insignificant. They didn't have the military power. They didn't have the resources. And yet they defeated an even greater power. And it is just so obvious that it is you who enabled. May we put our faith in you to face the challenges that are ahead of us. We have our history too, and a history of what you have given to us. All our springs are truly in you. You have refreshed us. You have given us life-saving word, words. But help us, Lord, to face whatever battle that is ahead, to always look back, to trust in the present, and to look forward with faith, hope, and confidence in you and your presence. We ask that you would bless as we give an offering this morning. And we give with joy in our heart that we can be part of your glorious people. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, let's prepare an offering for the Lord's work this morning. We're going to take up a last hymn. And this hymn sings of the majesty of who the Lord is. There was an invisible king that led the army of Israel that all the others didn't see. Just because he's invisible didn't mean he wasn't there. Right? That same king we sing about, speak about, worship, must be something we never take for granted. You know, in our heart, in our mind, that we belong to the people, the glorious kingdom. And here the Lord says, how I love the gates of. Who established? The Lord himself. And I like that. He records each one. This one born here. This one here. The Lord himself records it. And that is a very, very personal, wonderful, precious thought that the Lord will record your name and you belong to Him in a most wonderful way. Now, this is a hymn to conclude. How shall we respond? Who leads us? There is an invisible king that we are conscious of. And the Lord is our King. Oh, worship the King. Oh, glories above. Gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender. That's what God did. Defended, protected, enabled them to overcome their enemies. Ancient of days, pavilion in splendor, girded with praise. And that is our part. Tell of His might. Sing of His grace. Whose robe is the light. Whose canopy space. Now we read of this. The chariots of God. Thousands of them. Did you know that? The chariots of God were there. That's how they defeated 
the others. His chariots of wrath, deep thunder clouds form, that, and dark is his path on wings of the storm. The Lord is to be feared, but loved deeply by his people. Let's rise as we sing this beautiful hymn together. Let's conclude on a strong note of worship, shall we? Or worship the King. Let's pray together and ask that the Lord will bless us before we go from here this morning. And now may this great and glorious God of ours, the God who formed a nation and blessed it from something that seems so insignificant, that has become so obvious to the entire world, do a special work in our heart. And we ask that your grace will be given to us, even though we feel so insignificant at times, that we cannot amount to much, that we will continue to trust your wisdom, to trust your understanding, that we will hold firm and hold fast to our faith in you to take joy and pride to be your people. And we ask that your grace will be given to us to do this. May the Spirit of God fill our hearts this day, that we will go forth and reflect your presence to all who are around us, your love, your care, your wisdom, that your name will be blessed and praised now and forevermore. Amen.